Um, when radio came along, of course, they, they, they used that to the maximum. Uh, sports for the men, um, soaps basically for the women. And then in came television, as I say, with its alpha state, its hypnotic state. And sure enough, around the 1960s, really, 50s and 60s, it took off. It really, really took off. Uh, and men became glued on Saturday nights to the sports shows. A culture industry, which is called by its own the culture industry. The Soviet Union had a department called the culture industry. Their actors and directors were called the cultural leaders. Leaders. Because they would, like a computer, people are like computers. Um, all you have to do is keep giving them new updates every so often and you can change an entire country or a nation or a block of nations who are all getting the same uploads, upgrades at the same time along certain paths. Today we call it political correctness. Most people want to belong to their peer group. They want to be the same as everyone else when it comes to opinions. In fact, they judge their own personal sanity by bouncing ideas off their, their neighbors and friends who will answer back and agree on these same topics in kind. It doesn't matter if the topics or, the, or what you're given are facts or, or utter nonsense, as long as everyone agrees at the same time, you'll say, well, I'm sane, and your friends will all agree because they've had the same information given to them. But they've been programmed, and I, I'm sad because I know that it's hard for people like that to take an interest, a serious interest in world affairs, to take a serious interest in what their elected officials are doing. And they're not going to be really inclined to study uh, or discover the deception that's being used against them. And so I'm sad because I, I see all of that in a flash in my mind as being an indication of how easy it is for the masses to be manipulated. The scientific dictatorship understands what makes human beings tick. They understand our psychology. They've studied it and they're using it against us. But the minute the public awakens to the fact that there is an agenda to manipulate them, and the second the public realizes that they are being conditioned and controlled, the establishment begins to lose that edge they've got over people. So all I ask viewers to do is to think for themselves and to study public relations, to study advertising, to study propaganda, and to realize how much of it is out there in their daily lives. And then make the decision for yourself. I just want people to think on their own and to not have their decisions and their thoughts and their ideas uh, prepackaged and basically downloaded into them. If it's on TV and a famous face uh, says something, then it must be true. He doesn't have to show you facts or anything else. You'd, you've been brought up with these faces. That's why they keep these guys on television into their 70s and 80s. You've grown up with this father figure who's on television every night at six o'clock uh, in your house, in your room, staring right at you, uh, and he's a father figure. Would he tell you a lie? That that so you naturally never suspect him. And this same man will lead you through new topics. He'll he'll introduce experts on the topics. They'll have a little summary at the end of every talk, and you are now left with the conclusion that's presented to you. As you you don't arrive at it. It's given to you, and it's good enough for you. When I was growing up. People were talking on their front porches. Neighbors were playing baseball. There were nightly barbecues. You don't see that anymore. We've lost our communities. You drive through neighborhoods, you see the blue glow of television sets. We're losing our humanity. So if you want to rebel against the globalists, the social engineers, start by turning the TV off a few hours a day and actually getting to know your neighbors, getting outside that comfort zone, expanding your horizons. By coming together as communities, by getting to know our neighbors, we defeat the social engineers. We're programmed today uh, perfectly just like machines. We tie this, this in with the Brzezinski. Brzezinski said in two ages, now this guy was way up with the NSA. He was a, he's a master geopolitician. Uh, he works, he admits he works in, in 20, 50 year periods to do with geopolitics in other countries. 
But he said himself that the public will shortly be unable to think or reason for themselves. It was meaning by that the form that, that of, of, of uh, information that was given to them, the type, the, the formulas that were in use then in the 1970s, he says, eventually they'll be unable to think or reason for themselves. They, and eventually, he said, they will expect the media uh, to do all their thinking and reasoning for them. Well, that's happened today. That, that's why people today can't think outside of the programming from television. Zbigniew Brzezinski, Obama's main foreign policy advisor, talks about how a cult of personality can be artificially manufactured to influence the masses. In the first months of my administration, uh, to pull our economy... Oh, oh, goodness. Sorry about that, guys. Um, to pull our economy back from the brink, uh, including the largest and most sweeping economic recovery plan in our nation's history. We were gullible, but we're also willingly gullible. We want a human being, a big daddy, to come along and make everything right for us. And as long as we believe that, we'll always basically get shafted. In addition to John, sorry, the, the, uh, I just noticed that uh, I, I jumped the gun here. Go ahead and move it up. <laughs> I had already, already introduced all you guys. It's the presidential reality show. But when it became an Oprah production, it became slick. You don't have a president, you have an actor. They say that politics is show business for ugly people. You got it. What am I going to tell the president when I tell him his teleprompter is broken? <laughs> what will he do then? It's Obama's role to front for the international banking syndicate and to take all the heat for their unpopular agenda. It's his job to convince the American people that the buck actually stops at the White House. In Brzezinski's book, Between Two Ages, is that eventually we shall put presidents in who will have personality cults. We shall create massive personality cults for these people through the same techniques as Hollywood has used. Obama is that man today. The globalists who know that Obama is going to promote their uh, plan want to make him uh, such a superhero that nobody will question what he's doing. They'll be so preoccupied with who he is or where he is or what he's saying or what he's wearing or something like that. The idea of making him into a celebrity is very valuable uh, because that way people are less inclined to ask, what is he doing? So that's very useful to these people. Similar plans of social control have been continuously carried out by operatives of the Ford Foundation, who Obama has worked for over the last 30 years. Many of the strategies used to control populations were originally developed by Edward Bernays, who coined the phrase public relations. Bernays said that if you manufacture an authoritative figure who repeats the same messages over and over, that this will appeal to the masses subconscious desires Yes, we can. America the unwashed can. masses will helplessly follow the leader and go along with any message they spout. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. We shall overcome. Yes, we can. We will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Thank you. Today, these exact techniques are being used with devastating effect against the general population. Obama is the latest version of 21st century mass mind control. The psych warfare engineers are counting on Obama to finish the plan they began decades ago. Beyond their plans to devastate the economy for global consolidation, a new international framework of draconian law is being constructed to establish a system of neo-feudalistic serfdom. Remember, it was Bill Clinton who gave us NAFTA. And it was Al Gore, the hero of the environmental movement, who was the hatchet man for the Clinton administration to cram NAFTA down the throats of a reluctant Congress. 
Now, this is a good deal for our country, Larry, and let me explain why. Al Gore, who carried the ball for NAFTA and GATT, is now one of the top standard bearers for the elite's agenda. This, I didn't interrupt you. Okay, now, uh, uh, guys. Uh, yeah, maybe it just... Is this... NAFTA. Why? Huge numbers of manufacturing jobs left Canada, came into the United States because of a 15% wage differential. We pay our workers less in Canada. Now, when you've got a 7 to 1 wage differential between the United States and Mexico, you will hear the giant sucking sound. No, there's a political lesson, uh, there's a business I'm lesson. Sorry. He serves as the front man for the carbon tax cap and trade scheme, which will not only increase taxes on every American, but will also transfer our national sovereignty and rights to a tyrannical world government, all in the name of saving the earth is the legislation that we are discussing here today, is that something that you are going to personally benefit from? If you believe that the reason I have been working on this issue for 30 years is because of greed, you don't know me. I've been willing to put my money where my mouth is. Do you think there's something wrong with being active in business in this country? I am simply asking for clarification I'm proud of the it. relationship. I'm proud of it. My name is Dr. Tim Ball. I'm a climatologist. I have a PhD in climatology from the Queen Mary College, University of London, England. And I've been studying climate both with my nine years in the Canadian Air Force, where it was essential to flying, and then after that at the university. So it's essentially been uh, the whole theme of my career. Initially called climate skeptics, I said, but, but all scientists are skeptics. If you're not a, a skeptic, you're not a scientist. And, and then when that didn't work, then they came out with the charge that we were climate change deniers. And I remember when I was first called a denier, and it was in the Times of London and England. And, um, and of course, the word denier was clearly deliberately chosen because of the Holocaust connotations of that term. So it, it, was, it was not only a, a, a charge that you were ignoring the truth, but you were doing it in, in a very evil way. And uh, of course, I laugh about that now because my whole career has been anything but a climate change denier. I've spent my career trying to educate people to how much climate change is naturally. So I'm anything but a denier, but of course that that uh, is part of the politics. Under the Nazis, there was something called race science. They had a lunatic theory of, of eugenics, the Aryan heritage, and all the rest of this. Absolute crackpot pseudoscience. There was no empirical measure or empirical test for the validity of those theories. They simply asserted them, and if you were a professor who stood up to them, then the Gestapo would come and take you away. We are perilously close to such a situation right now. Any academic, any other figure standing up to say the global warming theory of Al Gore is a piece of crackpot nonsense is in danger. You'd be fired from a government job, and in many universities, your job would be in danger. And of course, it's also part of what's called ad hominem, that if you can't uh, defeat the person's argument rationally, you start attacking the person. And we see that with these terms, and we see it with... Al Gore calling them flat earthers. Congressman, you began by denying that there is a consensus on the science. There is a consensus on the science. Well, you mustn't have been listening to our testimony that we've had for the last few days with dozens of experts that have come in who have given completely different views. Well, there so are I would, people, I, would I would encourage you to go back and look at the testimony there, this committee's heard. There are people who still believe that the moon landing was staged on a movie lot in Arizona. And neither of us was, are one of those, and I know you like giving those cute anecdotes. This is not a cutesy issue. We're talking about no, that, that can that's... export millions of jobs out of our economy, out of our country. Richard Lindzen, the MIT professor of atmospheric physics, said it many years ago when he said the consensus was reached before the research had even begun. And then scientists like myself that stood up and said, hold on a minute, I got problems with this. Oh, paid by the oil companies. Don't trust that guy. What the international scientific community is saying is correct. There is no legitimate basis for denying it. Now, you hear the consensus argument. Well, the majority of scientists. What they're always talking about 
is, and originally the IPCC was about 3,600 scientists, it's now down to 2,500. That's the people they're talking about. But when you look at it, most of them are bureaucrats. They're not scientists at all.